thank you everyone for joining us on this conversation on the cheetah this is a very very special conversation for me because i have with me dr ranjit singh who is known to be the father of the wildlife protection act of india and has been responsible for the creation of some of the most uh, well known and I- important wildlife protected areas in india today he has helped to create what we have today in the way of a wildlife conservation movement and guides us till today on which direction the country should move in we also have with us dr chavra he has been somebody who has been very multifaceted throughout his career and one of the hats he wore was wildlife conservation he's done some extraordinary books on cheetahs in india and cheetahs uh, and asiatic lions we have with us elena who heads the mara mara meru uh, cheetah research program and she has been working on cheetah conservation now for 36 years so over to you elena tell us a little bit about what you have been uh, studying and what you have found out about cheetah relocation cheetah introductions and helping the cheetah population grow and expand from its present home ranges to other parts uh thank you very much for this introduction so let's start from one thing i've been working uh uh with cheetahs for 36 years almost 15 years in captivity and then other years in the wild in different countries and um experience in captivity helped me to interpret behavior in the wild and vice versa because i'm actually consulting our zoo and our conservation center on certain issues which they have with cheetahs in captivity um so we yesterday were just touching um the base of uh, translocation of cheetahs and i mentioned one case when i observed two cheetahs who were kept in the uh, in captivity in semi wild environment prepared to be released and those two um cubs who were rescued from the mara because mother disappeared have been fed with uh, only wild animal uh, meat but not actually um the live food but with uh prepared meat which was good already uh but unfortunately they had too much contact with people because they could see people who are coming to clean enclosure who were not petting them but at least calling them by names for food for feeding at that time when uh, we picked up the cubs with rangers they were approximately two and a half months old so already they were eating meat uh, not milk uh which again was good uh so when they were released um at the age of approximately 1 year to 2 uh, months which is appropriate age they were supplementary fed because they were trying to hunt um in the proper prey like zebras large wolf or dogs and it took them some time to actually understand how to hunt uh and they became very successful it was a female and a male so uh, may, I, may, may i just come in on this uh see uh, how many i mean if cheetahs from iran are crossing over but iran itself seems to have very few cheetahs left so i don't think that's going to get very far with uh, your them crossing across into the areas that you want them to come to. absolutely absolutely you see um i think that we should not be in a hurry that's a thing because you know when somebody was again recently telling me that it would be so nice to catch some asiatic cheetahs from iran and then place them in in a captivity and then uh, place them somewhere i said we have to be so careful because every single individual matters if it uh, like i think that maybe while we have some cheetahs maybe 70 to 90 individuals correct uh of asiatic oh, cheetahs i'm told 40 40 it's terrible i don't know in this case you know because i'm not involved in um asian project but i think it could be uh, put me be a lot of efforts to to save environment natural environment there in iran to support cheetahs that's anyway needed to be done right yes. um may i so, yes mm-hmm. because otherwise um, you know <laughs> yes sorry um 
where exactly you are not clear in the question to try to pick up um where exactly is was this reintroduction thing because i couldn't get it very clearly was it or kazakhstan or turkmenistan uzbekistan 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 uh, got a minute uzbekistan now uh, in that area uh, i hope i may ask you a, a few questions so that you can then give a composite reply i hope they will not be um uh it interbreeding between any stragglers from iran the asiatic cheetah of course of course and and no and the south african because that will spoil the entire um, effort absolutely so go in secondly uh, dr chawla said there were 40 my information is that there are now only three relic population numbering and that was two years ago less than 30 of which only two are breeding mm-hmm. so they are in the vicinity of 28 or less uh and they are south of the golistan national park which is in the elbow in the eastern side of elbow mm-hmm. the other thing is you mentioned rabbits but uh, there are hares there uh no rabbits and there are maybe two or three varieties one are very small pika hares the other is probably the desert hare dianus mm-hmm. and the third is a large one which goes on into kazakhstan and elsewhere which is the tolai hare so do you and and what other natural prey do you have that gazelle which gazelle gopsam kutorosa persian gazelle no, we don't hear you are there any urial there what is the natural prey very good question that was my question also um so that's the problem because uh because of high poaching in 1970s and 80s of saiga antelope which was Not the main saiga. prey yes now uh population is in, um improving but it's only in the conservation center which is in bukhara and it's actually not wild population it's fenced population and um we steer this pretty far away from there so basically we cannot um that's my personal opinion we cannot just take cheetah somewhere where there's no food at all absolutely uh and the second yes and the second thing my concern was in breeding between two uh gener- uh two um different subspecies that's why i was so happy to hear that asiatic cheetah appeared at the edge of the uh former historical range because it shows that we cannot introduce south african subspecies there because it, they can uh they first of all they will die because there is no food but if they succeed they can really <laughs> and um um contribute to disappearance native subspecies so that's uh, why yeah. more for uh ho- um keeping preparing the areas like for example there was an idea to set up more conservation areas in ustyur and then improve uh prey base build good infrastructure and prepare everything properly i was giving examples of Uh, how to prepare it uh by uh displaying your uh, i mean uh, um uh proposals and programs uh made in india for introduction of uh, cheetahs in india where everything is considered in details so um that what i was thinking a proper in, um approach you prepare everything and then you apply we prepare the environment we just need cheetahs so maybe uh, this is sorry. a good time for you to tell us about the cheetah reintroduction program no uh, if i may ask um, okay. about the uh, you see you cannot depend upon the saiga the saiga okay. is a migratory animal and the saiga comes up at a latitude of uh, of uh, uh, much north of this area up it comes up to southwards up to due west of the fargana valley they don't come up into the area close to the iran border in in uzbekistan and then they migrate north so i mean you expect the cheetah to move with the uh, the saiga 
and get frozen up there even the exactly. even the uh, uh, the adapted cheetah which has a more furry coat the iranian cheetah but your namibian cheetah will freeze and Absolutely. they can't migrate this the saiga is a migratory animal i think i think conceptually you will have to think about this and they have to think about it. of course that i even they, gave them must have a stationary base the cheetah is not a migratory creature so huh, that is the other okay Absolutely. You know, in Kenya, for example, they migrate, but the clim- climate is still the, chi- uh, the same. And on the way, they have a lot of prey of different species. And they have com- food competitors, but not that many uh, species as, for example, in um, uh, Uzbekistan. Because even small jackals who are living in the packs, they affect cheetahs. Other cats who are well, really adapted to live in these areas, they will really compete. So I would say there is no way to reintroduce cheetahs in Uzbekistan. And I'm... F- not fighting, I'm very peacefully fighting, I'm just slowing it down because I don't want, even if the money will be uh, released for that, I want people to be to understand that it's really serious thing. Sometimes they're saying they can hunt, um, you know, this um, crossbreed between uh, uh, diff, um, wild ass and uh, uh, wild horse we have some um, animals like that there. I, I'm sorry, I don't know the English name. I have to I have to look. But still, they're too big for cheetahs. Even coalition of cheetahs won't be able. It's like a big zebra. There's no way. Found one help. And also what I did, I calculated how much is intake per year for one cheetah of uh, meat. It's, it's clear that you can't freeze the rest of the meat and feed for a week. So it basically one kill per feeding. And if it's a single male, for example, a single female, it will be, for example, one antelope, uh, which will be not even consumed maybe fully. And next three days, it will need more food. The colder, the more food you need. And I found out that this population, which they have of it critically endangered saiga antelope, will last for two months. <laughs> so you see, even if they reproduce, it won't help. So I'm trying my best because I think it's a responsibility for the whole world. So could we talk about India and cheetahs? I think that would be uh, um, the next subject. All Please, right. Uh, yes. Um, as you know, Ellen, um, planning to uh, to reintroduce the cheetah in India. Uh, but prior to that, we are going to uh, reassess the suitability of the habitat. But more than the suitability of the habitat, which we have assessed, is the quantum of prey that is available and what needs to be done to upgrade those areas uh, for uh, the arrival of the cheetah so that you have a sustainable population which then can be um, you know multiply and spread in the neighboring areas uh, they could have fatal distribution but that um, apart uh, there are a couple of questions that i wanted to ask you and uh, with regard to your expertise. Um, the, and this is what I have been also discussing with uh, Laurie Marker. Whether it is more um, advisable, suitable to get wild caught cheetahs, um, which are prescribed as cattle lifters. And you know the story in Namibia where they are prescribed and they can be hunted. Uh, they are described as uh, livestock raiders and they can be and they can even be shot in, and, and uh, exported out of uh, um, uh, of Namibia under society. Uh, her opinion was it is better to take uh, because he, she says that if you get wild caught cheetahs they will simply disappear. They'll ju- just run away and then you will have to hold them back from wherever. She was of the opinion that it is better to have uh, hand-reared cheetahs or whatever which can then be uh, rewilded and then introduced. And then you could form a, uh, a coalition of siblings or coalition of males and you know, a coalition is always better, at least in the beginning. But from that point of view, um, 
what would you suggest? Because uh, logically, wild caught cheetahs would have a better option. But she felt that wild caught cheetahs will, uh, will simply just run away and disappear. And therefore, this is better. My worry is that can the cheetah which are bred in captivity and which have been specially bred for reintroduction to the wild and rewild it, uh, will they be able to succeed in an area uh, like India? Very good question. Uh, first of all, um, the areas where you will be rewilding or reintroducing cheetahs. Well, you will be uh, the areas where you will be reintroducing cheetahs. Uh, do you have any livestock in those areas, um, let's say, available or on the way of cheetahs? For example, um, is there any... There, are, there, there would be livestock. Livestock here is of two kinds, of course. Uh, the, one, the, the larger livestock, which is cows and buffaloes, of course, are out of reach of the cheetah. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. they can't kill them uh, just as well. And uh, sheep and goats. In some areas, they may be sheep and goats. But okay. we would like not to have them on that because though they can survive on that it would result in man-animal conflict which uh, yes, we absolutely. have a problem with in India and we don't want to accelerate that and that would then ultimately mean in we having to compensation is fine but then the retributory killings of the local shepherds that's uh, why I when nobody is in that will result and then the animosity of the population we are a democracy and then the people will ultimately say we don't want these cheetah here they are abusers sorry for interrupting you that's the reason i asked you because if you take cheetahs who were raised in captivity for example they will go um so first of all even if you have cheetahs for example within africa uh, for example, who were um, like raised in South Africa in one place and then they're translocated to the other park in the same South Africa. Environment will be different. And what happens, animals have to set up, which means that they have to first find the appropriate prey. For that, there is a solution. If you have wild caught cheetahs or not wild caught, you introduce local prey in that close environment, in close um, enclosure, and give opportunity for cheetahs to hunt on those animals in the big enclosure, which is supposed to be as big as possible, so animal can really run or maybe stalk from the short distance and kill these animals. Environment supposed to be almost equal to that where cheetahs will be translocated. It's called soft release. So what I mean by that? Let's talk first about the fact of translocation in terms of food. Doesn't matter where cheetahs are coming from, any a region, you take them to India, you build enclosure where or close to where you are going to translocate cheetahs. The reason why it's better to have it not far away from the place where you will be translocating or releasing them is because cheetahs, like other, some, some other species, have homing behavior, which means that they will come back to the place where they were kept in semi-captivity for food and for environment because they will feel more safe. And the distance can be over 400 kilometers. You don't need that, right? You need cheetahs to be released and just settle. Definitely cheetahs will move away if they will find the way to hunt. If the area is full of prey where you're going to release it, at first, you can feed killed animals of those species to cheetahs while well, you keep them in pre-release uh, enclosure. And then when you translocate them to the bigger enclosure where they will just release some antelopes for them for hunting, that would be the second stage. And they will learn how to hunt local animals and then you release them to the wild. It will take time. It's very important that by that time you will have radio collar. And of course, it's better to create uh, groups, temporary groups, because they might stay forever or they might split, it doesn't matter, but it's always advisable to 
reintroduce or translocate and release cheetahs together. It's easier for them to settle and uh, even to take larger prey. So basically for that, it will be easier for them to start preying and hunting together in semi-captivity and then in the wild. Then why I'm asking about them uh, livestock? Because sooner or later, they will start in um, exploring the area and they will come to the edge where they will come across local people and herds. And if they find out that it's easy to kill livestock, they will go for it. So if we're talking about cheetahs who were translocated from South Africa because they have been problematic, you will bring problem to India. Because um, once they tried it, they will go for it. Uh, we know about that. And we already have a huge enclosure ready to receive. The prey base there needs to be built up, but it is there. Uh, which brings me to the other question. Uh, but uh, that they may not be very, very close to the area of release. Okay. And therefore, if we build an enclosure in an area of release, what should be the minimum size? If we have to get, I'll just finish. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still, I would still ask that question. In that enclosure, and, and you see, they will get very, uh, we are aware of that, that they will get accustomed to the Indian animals very soon, because after all, they are uh, uh, gazelles and all that. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that when cheetah were imported from Mombasa, which is from Tanzania, Tanganyika as it was then, and from Kenya, right up to the First World War and thereafter. They, our cheetah trainers, used to train them in two months. And those who had been hunting Impala and Grant's gazelle and, and, and Thompson, Thompson's gazelle were trained to chase not just the black buck, but the blackest of the black black. That was the extent of training. And that is where the cheetah comes in. He, he was like a pet, but they could hunt. But the purpose was different. The purpose was to keep them as pets and then make them out. Here we want them to hunt. We are not going to train them to Absolutely. only kill male black buck and male chinkara. That's not mm -hmm. the point. The okay. point is that so they will get adapted to Indian animals. You have no doubts about that. The thing is uh, that even in those enclosures and that stage of a soft release followed by a general release, keeping in mind the fact that we don't have the extensive territories that you have in, in Masai Mara and in Kenya and all that, that our parks are small and they are surrounded by human habitations. And therefore, we have to think of an area where they can have spatial distribution. But that apart, so they will come. When we, either we remove them physically and transplant them into a second house, or we allow them, if the place is good enough, their distribution and and uh, reoccupation of uh, occupation of other areas on their own. But at the same time, so one is what is the size that you would recommend for a minimum enclosure? We know the one we have, but that if you want to build it in the area where we are going to reintroduce, so it's just a question of you know opening up the gate, what should be the minimum size? Secondly, uh, even there in the enclosure, will it be better to have a hand-reared animal or a wild pop? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, let's cover all these questions. Um, first of all, uh, if we're talking about the park, how big is the park? Because uh, the territory of the cheetah or home range depends on availability of prey and also on number of other conspecifics and also number and abundance. Um, so the, uh, the size of the home range or territory of a cheetah, single cheetah, depends on the number or density of prey of other conspecifics and also other predators or competitors. For example, if in the park you have leopard and maybe tiger or even a leopard, 
it's already competitor for the same food sources. And for cheetahs, it's, uh, it's so what we found in the wild in Kenya, cheetahs are staying not far away from lions, but they wait for lions to move from this particular spot and then they come even under the same bush. And then they're looking how other predators like hyenas, lions and leopards move around and they take the space. When lions are coming back, cheetah moves. Because among all the predators, cheetahs would be the weakest link. Now, where from to take cheetahs? I would say that uh, maybe uh, cheetahs who were born and raised by mothers in the wild would be better. Even, for example, in Namibia or in Eastern Africa, if those cheetahs, for some reason, um, became unwell, uh, unwell, unneeded in that area, they can be translocated. Uh, of course, with South African suspicious, it's easier because you know there's so many cheetahs that they actually consider as pets, pests there. You have many cheetahs there. In Eastern Africa, there are only a few because the biggest populations of cheetahs are in Southern Africa, Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa. In Eastern Africa, maybe we have 1,200 only. So um, that would... The, we are aware of the, the predator competition. The introduction would be in an area where there would be no uh, conflict with tiger. Okay. Uh, we are aware of the fact that if a reintroduction is to be made of two species, the cheetah should come first, being a smaller predator, and then land or tigers would come in. But we would like to have the cheetah where there would be no tigers, no lions. Perfect. Uh, so That's that is a, is a is a priority consideration. However, there would be some leopard. The leopard cannot always be taken out, and it will be in 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 a in a couple of places. We have to decide because we have to reassess those habitats again, and we are going to do this as soon as this COVID thing is over. The government has sanctioned the uh, the project, and we are in the process of sending people out. Lining up the team to send, I hope, in a month's time or so. So we should know what is what and the size of the uh, thing, but our areas are not as large as this. But that, okay, the apart from the uh, leopard, in one or two places, there could be wild dog competition, or perhaps wild dog, few uh, on albinos. But ah. uh, it's actually, you know, it would not be serious. Uh, there are very, very few, if any. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in that way, there is no competition. But the problem is twofold, really. One is the size of the area, which it can be called a core area. The other area is uh, is a kind of a, a peripheral area where there could be, um, you know, interference or demographic pressures from livestock and rest of it but in the core area we will try to so one is the size of the area the other is the prevalence those are the two very very important considerations we are not uh, we'll take care of the having said that we uh, and i take your point that um, uh, that the uh, wild cork cheetahs that is that is what my gut feeling is uh, with whatever association I've had with uh, nature or wildlife. But uh, Laurie seems to think that they will simply run away in our small areas and we will have a problem in their form. Uh, look, we can try both and see how it goes. Uh, because as you know, they are surplus here in South Africa and in Namibia anyway. That is one. The other is a minimum size. Now, the minimum size, I don't think, look, the area which we have already ready is a very large area. And that area is absolutely cheetah country. That's no problem there. But the release may not be impossible in that area because it is the next to it. That whole big area was built to rehabilitate tiger of all things. So there are tiger next to it. And we can't release them, not just there, for the time being, because the tiger already there, and we and we won't go it anyway. So they will have to go somewhere else. In that somewhere else, it will be very costly 
to build that big enclosure and look we if it comes to that we have the money and the gumption to do so but the reintroduction of the cheetah in india cannot be a reintroduction into a glorified large safari park mm-hmm. it cannot be it can be the first stage agree we build and we build up but that is not one's objective of having them in a huge area of fence stock we have a wonderful place like that in rajasthan you fence off 18 square kilometers is gorgeous but that will be they can't go out it's an island so it's not viable so we have to build it we have to you see the whole idea is through the cheetah with the cheetah as a flagship to upgrade our national parks and sanctuaries our protected areas our grasslands that is good it is unique five different species of cats amazing so, so we have to have that vision and with that objective while the iron is hot to build up that a uh, tempo and upgrade those parks so that those parks at least even and i'm prepared for that even if the cheetah doesn't succeed and i'm prepared to we are prepared for that we are not going to experiment at least those parks will improve and with it will improve the other very endangered biota like the character nobody is thinking of the indian character today there are probably less than 100 left nobody is bothered which is the habitat of the tiger and, and so the cheetah is a way to a means it is an end in itself but it's not the, the reestablishment of the cheetah must also have other ramification so that is the whole idea and with that objective but at the same time do we are prepared for this we don't want to fail and therefore to reduce the imponderables the reduce the kind of uh, objections and the kind of pitfalls that may be on the way that is where expertise comes in from people like you and that is why i am asking these questions and so i come back again what is the minimum size of the area that we should have for the enclosure uh for the enclosure let's I mean, see. it cannot be related just, to uh, the size of the park may i just come if it's small no we will build a, we don't want to build anything smaller than the minimum necessary at least it should be 2 hectares the big enclosure 200 what 2 hectares Two hectares. Yes, that's too small. Um, you know, for let's say for the chase, especially if you have different type of environment, that would be minimum. If you can build bigger, that would be better. She think two hectares is the minimum size to keep of an enclosure to keep a cheetah in. But that would be a to keep actually that would to be a cage. that would we be a cage put them in cages so 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 basically the bigger the better but it shouldn't be just one it should be a set of enclosures because you know um, actually what i can do maybe i can find some um i have it in my previous um um not not this presentation but the one which i made for the conference about translocation of cheetahs uh the schematic uh like plan of that because you know i think the best way would be to find how they did it in south africa because there is like set of enclosures and then the big enclosure where you list you release cheetahs for hunting it's it's uh, the chavra i'm sure wants to ask some question they have been one of like uh-huh. yeah but see i i what what the question questions that i have really on the reintroduction of cheetah in india it, one is of course the size of the enclosure and as far as possible the enclosure should be within the area or adjoining the area where the cheetah is ultimately to be released that's one yes. Yes. point number 2 that i i would like to emphasize at this point is that this experiment should be done simultaneously at two or three different places you know it's just not one not at one place because that may just not work also see when you introduce coalitions of cheetah you said three males or so 
than how many females also if you look at the reproduction of cheetahs the the familiarity breeds contempt kind of situation with these guys so what happens to people in of cheetahs when you have reintroduced them because at the end of the day we want a stable population to grow not just to stultify at the numbers that you have put in good point um of course you're right about uh cheetahs uh like trying different locations uh and uh there is a big advice actually for those who've done these translocations of cheetahs in south africa to make coalitions or groups of animals and release them simultaneously. Also, for example, if you're planning, because um, uh, you mentioned about uh, tigers to be released in certain area, you have to release first a recessive species in terms of dominance and then dominant species. So basically, if you release cheetahs first, they can adopt. And then when you release tigers, they already adopted, they can survive. Everything depends on the entire environment of the um, reserve or park. The reason being, you know, about the carrying capacity. Each area keeps um, has its own carrying capacity, which can carry only certain number of prey species and uh, predators, numbers of predators. And even if you put more for the sake of survival, they will start moving because they can't coexist in the one area. At the same time, if you have enough prey, it will be a rich prey base. Tigers and cheetahs can live in the same field. They will just come for hunting to the same field and just go different ways. There will be no need for competition. Why actually these top predators like tigers or for example leopards or lions compete with cheetahs for environmental conditions, which is the prey base and the comfortable place for giving birth and raising cubs. That's the major reason. So, for example, if there is a semi bushy or foresty with some areas which are open environment for cheetahs, they will perfectly coexist even with leopards. They can come across each other and just pass by without any interaction. Because if leopard has cubs, she will do everything just to be not seen by other predator. Cheetahs do the same. Of course, if leopard come across cheetahs, it might co kill cubs. But if at that time, leopard has cubs, she won't kill other cubs. Because for her, it's more important to be safe, not to interfere with anything. So even with tigers, I believe they can coexist. Also, you're right. We, um, I understand you're saying we don't want to fail. But you see, always when you start something, you, you meet some problems because that's how we learn. And if somebody will ask me how this cheetah will behave, I will tell them, I can't predict all animals are different. All areas are different. Even when you put together two females, they might make very good alliance and be released together and keep each other with each other nicely. Now we're coming coming to the question about inbreeding and how many species, um, how many individuals do I have for some uh, males? In the beginning, I would say it has to be calculated in terms of the area. Uh, if you know how many leopards you have in that particular park where you're going to release cheetahs, that has to be taken into account. So let's say the whole area, uh, like digitally or mentally, can be divided into areas um, uh, which territory will be in not enough available for each individual because their home ranges and territories overlap, right? So now what happens you have, uh, for example, a coalition of three males. If they have one or two females, that would be enough. You don't know how many males will survive within first year. So for the first year, we should actually forget about any breeding. It will be a learning process, how they will settle. Because um, even if they mate, they have to find each other. At first they have to settle, then they have to find each other, and then they have to mate, and then cheetah has to give birth. So, the uh, question is, in a reintroduction program, obviously the reintroduction program is looking at a long-term survival of a viable population. So, what should be the number of animals that one should start with for a reintroduction program like this? And in how many locations would you say? You know, if I know, for example, the size of the park, it will be a little bit easier because, you know, it depends on that too and other predators. If we're talking about just uh, any available land, you can start with, for example, 
um, three or four different groups of cheetah males. What is the size of the park that we're talking about so that Elena has some idea? What is the landscape area we're talking about for cheetah reintroduction? The survey will start very soon. Uh, the survey will um, will consider the areas where we had surveyed them before and found the two three sites suitable. It will also have to be, we have a federal system of government, so we have to also take and, and uh, the political what is the minimum size, Jeet? And I mean, therefore, the uh, we will have to uh, take uh, the cognizance of and the approval of the state government. Uh, we have already written to them. The Jeet. Supreme Court has formed a supervisory committee with me in the lead. And uh, uh, the government has given a, a principal approval. Jeet, but the what would the uh, approximate? Approximate size of the areas B. So, um, you know, going between this and this just to give, give us an idea. They range from something like 400 square kilometers to 1200. Jeep. But the core areas are smaller. No, that's fine. But 400 uh, to 1200 yes, square where kilometers. They had scope for expansion. G. In the case of Shahga, G. the scope is huge. G. But the problem is whether it is suitable or not. G. Uh, the habitat is okay, the prey do. It Ji. comes to the prey base all the time. Because Ji. we have sheep and goats, but we don't want a kind of a sheep and goat uh, survive, uh, uh, dependent uh, cheetah population. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Elena, something like 400 square kilometers, how many uh, coalitions of males, how many coalitions of females, what sort of sizes for these coalitions? Let's say if there are no other predators there, just completely nothing, no competition, and there's a lot of prey which is available everywhere, of course we have to consider environment. Because if you have hills and uh, you have open areas where it's easy to hunt, of course cheetahs will go for semi-bushy environment. Uh, I would say that two coalitions of males and maybe three females. That would be maximum for 400 kilometers. But you can expect that these cheetahs will explore, will explore areas on the edge. They will have to go there because they have to find out the suitable environment. And by that, you might come across a case where local population uh, will be not happy to have them around. So, uh, of course, so when the area will be assigned it has to be a lot of work with local population and maybe some kind of not only education education is good but it won't help to save livestock it has to be some kind of the program uh, supporting like local um, population of uh, helping them to herd for example even local dogs can uh, work really perfect so um, in um, when we're talking about them uh, actually, doll, uh, the uh, the red oh, we call them in Russian red wolves. The dolls, you know, um, there can be competitors, but uh, I think they're so much more uh, adaptable that I think the cheetahs can survive with them too. Okay. Um, so I think one other important question that we wanted to know is, would it be possible to consider East African cheetah for relocation to India? Would you be able to? help us source animals that we could get and help us to maintain this over a period of time. Would you know people who would be able to help us do that um, instead of the South African cheetah? Um, I know some people who are staying in Tanzania, but those cheetahs they have, they're captive cheetahs. They were taken as cubs and um, uh, kept in uh, captive environment, but now because of uh, restriction in Eastern Africa, uh, because of these animals are inside us and they're red list um, appendix one cheat uh, animals, it's very difficult to get permission. Also, you see, when we're applying for anything, uh, like for any reason to get the animals, we have to like kind of proof that the reason we're taking is um, we know what we're doing, we know what, what we're doing, it's like it will be success. In this case, we never know, right? Especially taking account that this, these animals were sitting actually in the captivity and were fed with cow and uh, sheep and goat me uh, meat, right? 
So already they were not raised to hunt natural prey. It has to be really long um, program. And believe me, those cheetahs will go for um, for humans because they're already associated with humans. Uh, ideally, those should be cheetahs which were caught somewhere. And uh, for example, you see why we're talking about South Africa, because the owner of the area in Namibia, for example, doesn't want cheetahs to be in his farm. And he's happy to set up the trap cage and take these cheetahs away. <coughs> so he's telling Laurie and the other organization, take them away, other will kill them. So Larry takes them and translocate to those areas where cheetahs are welcomed. In Eastern Africa, nobody cares about them. They're just killed. If herders don't like them in unprotected areas, they simply shoot them or spear them. Um, in um, There are no private facilities here where cheetahs are kept. It's only, uh, for example, orphanage, cheetah or not cheetah. It's a, a Kenny Wedlef Service Nairobi Park Orphanage where cheetahs <coughs> Sorry, which were <coughs> I'm talking with loud. It's okay. Which were um, uh, which were caught from the wild. Uh, they're kept in captivity. They're fed with um, this cow meat. They won't be able to be translocated. They're completely dependent on people. Um, so with Eastern Africa, I think um, the level of work should be in between uh, Kenyan government and Indian government. So, for example, if you really prepare really great environment for uh, cheetahs, uh, where you actually take in consideration and prepare the prey base, so it's improved, and you can see that even if certain animals will be called every day by certain predators, the population will not go down, but will be sustainable. I'm talking about prey population of different species, that's one thing. It's better when there are several species at least. The second thing, local population is aware and they agree with that, that cheetahs will be translocated and they're aware that cheetahs might come for livestock, but they're prepared. It could be compensation program, which is really not working working really well, unfortunately, in, in Africa um, at least, or at least they will have some su support from the government or private organizations, like maybe guardian dogs, maybe building some proper enclosures, maybe something else where um, people will be really comfortable to have cheetahs around, but they will see, even if they see them in the other side of the field, they will know we're safe, our livestock is safe, we don't mind those cheetahs to be around. So it means that the initial pro problem, why they disappeared will be eliminated. Yes. Uh, One population, you see what we must have, um, and ensured uh, supply. The other thing is CITES. We have to have CITES permission. Mm -hmm. Now, there is, a, there is a population of cheetah caught from Somalia, in Somalia, mm -hmm. which would be the closest to us in that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. uh, Lori is handling that. But they are all caught there illegally for illegal export to the sheikhs across the, the Red Sea mm -hmm. and they are all tamed and they are not uh, properly reared they have been captured from dhows they have captured from all over the place they are like they are tamed domesticated practically the second thing is that Somaliland is I think been blacklisted by scientists we will never get permission from CITES to export them. So they say all these are problems we have to consider. We, we have to have a legal CITES cleared export so that we export them. We are a founding member. Actually, India was the first chairman of CITES and we don't want to bypass or break the CITES. One. Secondly, we must have an insured supply and the whole thing after all our efforts will depend upon the quality of the animals brought in we don't want animals which will let us down and that first of all let themselves down what about and thirdly yeah. a, in a short supply so from that point of view what is your suggestion 
as where do we get them from? South Africa, Namibia? Have you considered Ethiopia? Because uh, there's uh, no, another... they don't have it. They don't have that many. They don't have that many. No, no, they don't have that many. There were never that many there. And they it, it is Somaliland, most Somalia. The Horn of Africa. Um, it, it's easier. The Tita are there, but right down. So uh, Ethiopia is high country. Um, uh, there are no cheetahs in a wash national park. There are no cheetahs further up north in the Omo Valley. There are only a few, and they, that is not on. Actually, uh, there were there are cheetahs in Omo. Yes, and most of them have been cut, but there are they are there because they uh, are there, but uh, but the but people they, wear them. They are very few, very Jeep. few, and Jeep. they are not there to spare. They are not there. We need we need animals which are available, and there is, as I said, a constant a, 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 a short supply. Uh, that and then uh, the anyway. Uh, so that is one important consideration. The the other thing is that um, in the case of um, the release, I wanted to ask. We have been advised, uh, uh, the technical uh, thing is that uh, when we release them from an enclosure, the larger enclosure the better, I take your point well. Um, the, uh, the female should be released first and then the males. Would you agree to that? It's very hard because to... Because he says the males run away faster. If the female... Um, uh, uh, or would it be other around? What is your experience? Which should be, maybe coalition, but which sex should be released first, male or female? Um, you know, as I've never done it in my life, I can rely only on two official records. And in each area, it was different. Absolutely different. Because in, in every case. Oh. Yes. Because it depends on environment.